can accept decisions as uh, more, more fair, knowing that a broad array of judges have considered the matter and the courts aren't restricted to just some. There's an important role modeling function so that young people in our country, young students, law students, young lawyers, know that the path of public service on the bench is open to everyone, not just those who've taken a certain career path. Uh, and then I hope to be able to bring something to discussions with my judicial colleagues, if confirmed, because of my experience. Uh, just in the way, I, you know, I'm aware of the collegial nature of our circuit courts. And from clerking, I'm aware that judges conference after oral arguments to discuss their impressions about any particular case. And just like a colleague with a background as a state court judge might notice one fact in the record and want to discuss that, or a colleague with a background in mergers and acquisitions might notice another fact in the record and want to discuss that, or a prosecutor, still yet another fact. I hope that I, too, can bring something to our discussion because of my experience as a federal public defender and thereby enhance our collective uh, discussion and decision making. Well, thank you both. I really appreciate your answering uh, my questions. I look forward to supporting your nominations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kuhn. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the nominees for being here. Congratulations uh, on your nominations. Uh, Ms. Jackson Akumi, if I could start with you, I want to ask you again about the Reginald Taylor case in which I think you served as a defense attorney. This was an armed robbery case. I want to ask you about your sentencing memorandum in this case. You argued in that memorandum that the defendant uh, should not be subject to the 15-year mandatory minimum for uh, the armed career criminal minimum, that is, should not apply uh, to this defendant. It was a mandatory minimum. So just w walk me through this. W what was your argument uh, about not applying a, a mandatory minimum sentence? Is it your view that, that judges should be free to depart from those mandatory minimums? Just help me understand your argument there. Thank you, Senator, for the question and the opportunity to address that. That argument was based on the Armed Career Criminal Act which stated, Congress stated, that defendants should only be subject to the mandatory minimum if they had certain predicate offenses in their criminal history. The predicate criminal offense uh, that the government relied on in Mr. Taylor's criminal history was residential burglary. The Supreme Court and the Seventh Circuit and many circuits around the country were working through the issue of whether residential burglary qualified as a predicate offense. We took the position that residential burglary did not qualify as a predicate offense. And if it did not, that meant the mandatory minimum of the Armed Career Criminal Act would not apply in Mr. Taylor's case. Very good. That makes sense to me. Let me ask you about something you wrote in that same sentencing memorandum. You wrote that uh, this departure from the, from the mandatory minimum was appropriate because, and I'm, I'm quoting now, when black defendants continue to receive longer sentences than white defendants for the same crime, no additional time should be added to further entrench this disparity, end quote. It, is it your view that the, the Armed Career Criminal Act or, or mandatory minimum sentences in general are racist and inherently racially disparate? Senator, thank you for that question as well. Uh, th there has been research by the Sentencing Commission and other uh, agencies in our government that have showed, uh, have shown, the research has shown the racial uh, impact of mandatory minimum sentences. It's an issue that this body and this very committee has considered. Uh, what I was referring to in the portion of my sentencing memorandum that you quoted is the Supreme Court law, their Supreme Court case law that says, above and beyond a mandatory minimum, a judge does not have to impose any additional time. Uh, if the judge, in her discretion, feels that the mandatory minimum will impose what Congress has stated the standard is, a sentence that is uh, sufficient but not greater than necessary, then the judge does not have to add time on top of that. And so the argument that I was making to the judge was, look, court, if you feel the mandatory minimum imposes a sufficient uh, but not greater than necessary sentence on Mr. Taylor here, please do not add additional time on top. Let me ask you a question that I've asked other nominees that have come before this committee. Do you think that the U.S. criminal justice system is systemically 
racist or is infected with systemic racism and bias? Well, Senator Hawley, those are not terms that I use. Uh, in the law, when we look at issues of race, uh, we look at discrimination, which has very specific standards under Supreme Court and statutory law in terms of making findings. And so courts will be generally looking for attorneys to prove up discriminatory intent, discriminatory impact, in some cases retaliation. Uh, there's no Supreme Court doctrine that speaks to systemic racism, and it's certainly not um, a, um, it's, it's, it, there certainly aren't words that I've ever used in a court of law to make claims uh, based under the Constitution or the applicable statutes. And, and those are, just to be clear, that that's, those are not words, descriptors you would use to describe our, our criminal justice system as it currently exists. That is certainly not the way, as an advocate, uh, I would be able, under the law, to approach any case involving race. Very good. Let me uh, ask you about uh, the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act. In a presentation you did for the Illinois Institute of Continuing Legal Education, you stated at the time that uh, the law includes a new mandatory minimum condition, mandatory condition rather, of electronic monitoring for all persons who are charged with a long list of sexual abuse or pornography crimes, including failure to register as a sexual offender under the appropriate statute. Now, in your presentation to other defense counsel, you noted that a number of district courts had found this act unconstitutional as a violation of the excessive bail clause of the Eighth Amendment, procedural due process grounds under the Fifth Amendment, and separation of powers doctrine. So let me, I just want to ask you about this, since you were advocating these argue, making these arguments to other defense counsel, do you believe that the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act is unconstitutional on Eighth Amendment grounds? Sitting here, Senator, I actually can't remember that presentation that you're referring to or anything I might have said in that presentation. What I can tell you is that if confirmed as a judge, I am certainly bound by the statutes of this body and uh, would be called upon to apply them um, to the facts of any, any case that's before the Seventh Circuit. Very good. And I wanted to ask you the same question about uh, the statute being unconstitutional on Fifth Amendment grounds or separation of powers grounds. Is your answer the same for those as well? Y yes, Senator. I'm sorry. I don't recall that presentation or the content. That's fine. What we'll do is I'll, I'll give this to you as a question for the record, which will give you opportunity to go back and, and look at your notes, and, and you can get back to us uh, on that once you've had a chance to review. Just in my uh, final moments, uh, I, I wanted to say, uh, Judge Jackson, that um, I noticed I think I'm right about this, that you served some years ago on the board of Montrose Christian School. Is that right? Have I got, have I got yes, that right? Yes, Senator, for about a year. G got it. Well, I, I mentioned it because I noted uh, in the board's uh, statement of faith at the time, it said that we should speak on behalf of the unborn and contend for the sanctity of all human life from conception to natural death. It went on to say that children from the moment of conception are a blessing and heritage from the Lord. The school also took the position that marriage is the uniting of one man and one woman in a covenant commitment for a lifetime and that the state has no right to impose penalties for religious opinions of any kind. Now, those are positions that I, I happen to agree with, which is beside the point. I raise them because I distinctly recall that Justice Amy Barrett was attacked for serving on the board of Trinity Schools which took similar positions. I defended her at that time. I'd certainly defend your right to religious liberty and to serve on this board, whatever your opinions may be, at the same time. And I, I take it that from your service that you believe in the principle and the constitutional right of religious liberty. Is that fair to say? Well, Senator, um, I do believe in religious liberty. Uh, that is a, a foundational tenet of our entire government. Our constitutional scheme, the Supreme Court has made clear through its case law uh, that um, governments can't infringe on people's religious rights. Um, those ideas, that concept comes from my duty to observe Supreme Court precedent, to follow its uh, uh, tenets, not from any personal views that I might have and any personal views about religion uh, would never come into my service as a judge. I would also say uh, that I've served on many boards and that I don't uh, necessarily agree with all of the uh, statements of any 
of all of the, the things that those boards might have in their materials. The statement that you read, um, I'm not even sure that that was something that was in uh, the school's uh, circumstances at the time that I was there because I was not aware of that. But in any event, um, I do believe in religious liberty, yes, Senator. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Blumenthal.